next talk will be given by Massimo Capone. It's uh, orbital selective mode physics and the phase diagram of ion-based superconductors from CISA. Half an hour, then I'll show you five minutes. Thank you. Thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to talk. It's always nice to talk at a series of conferences that I've really grown up with. Thank you for sticking around so late. So, okay, the title is basically the one that has been already introduced. I start with a list of co-workers. Oh, sorry. So, there is a long list of co-workers co uh, involved in various sub-projects, but I mainly would like to list uh, the main ones, so Luca de Medici, who has a, a, a space A, sorry, there is a little mistake here, and Laura Fanfarillo, who is at CISA now, and Luca Giovannetti, who used to be at CISA in the group until a, a while ago. So, well, I can skip this thing, and essentially, uh, so what I will discuss mainly today is the origin of these orbital selective correlations that have been mentioned yesterday by Lara in the stock, and are now becoming a big, a big point in the, uh, the field of iron-based superconductors and actually in general of materials with multi-orbital correlations. So, okay, this is something that you basically all know about, but it's just to point out the fact that when you look at the phase diagram of the cube rates and you say, well, uh, all the physics of the cube rates is basically about doping a motto insulator, doping is a key word. So, uh, organizing things as a function of doping is what makes you really realize that these materials are highly correlated. You start from this Mott insulator, and then you have a series of phases which are sort of less and less strange, less and less correlated, until you eventually end up in a Fermi liquid. If you take a snapshot at some point, then asking the question about the role of correlation would be a little harder, unless, you, of course, you, you take the snapshot in the antiferromagnetic insulator. This is actually an example where the thing of taking snapshots has been really important. This is a class of materials, the alkali doped metal fullerites that we worked a lot about in Trieste in these years, where now we have this nice phase diagram as a function of the, basically the volume per C60, where you have a superconducting dome with a, some maximum at some distance from a MOT insulator, which of course, when you put your uh, fullerene buckyballs sufficiently far apart that the hopping becomes small and you end up in the SMOT regime. So you have now, you have this phase diagram that you understand quite nicely as something where electron phonon interaction drives superconductivity, but it has to deal, and as a matter of fact, it exploits the fact that there are strong correlations. Actually, before 2000, essentially we only had materials in this region, in the region where for example, the plot of critical temperature as a function of the lattice spacing was quite boring. This is the result you find in a BCS theory, and everyone was like concluding that, the, that these materials were just BCS superconductors, and there was no correlation physics whatsoever. So, you know, taking a snapshot in the wrong place may be uh, misleading. So, this is the, the point I want to make, is that now, if you want to look at the iron-based superconductors, we should really look at the big picture, not take a snapshot in the wrong place. I, okay, this is just an introduction to iron-based superconductors that is probably useless now. We have all this plethora of materials sharing this structure with iron, layers of iron and something else. And we have this kind of phase diagrams. This is just a bunch of relatively old phase diagrams, which all share an important thing. Superconductivity appears doping a spin density wave metal. So clearly, if you look superficially at these phase diagrams, you would like to compare with all of these, where in all cases, you start from something which is magnetic, you dope it, and you end up with a dome of superconductivity. But as we see in a second, and you all know, there are some important differences. So I'm asking the question whether we really have to compare this phase diagram, and I will give you a sort of twisty answer. So again, looking things very broadly, one has good reasons to think that the iron-based superconductors 
are somehow similar to the cube rate, so they are correlated. So, for example, I mean, may, let's say most people believe that the mechanism of superconductivity is magnetic. Uh, superconductivity appears doping this magnetic state, and the metal is not a really good metal. It shows incoherence in several properties. But on the other hand, there are aspects which look point in a different direction. Uh, first of all, uh, mo uh, foremost, the fact that the parent compounds are not moth insulators. They are metals. This is a big difference. And there are much, some more subtle things. It's not so easy to identify Hubbard bands and features which are typical of moth insulators. And uh, the density functional theory doesn't fail as badly as it does in the cuprates and gives you a band structure which at least has something to do with what we observe in experiments. Of course, there, is, there can be a sort of simple answer to this uh, dichotomy, that these materials are just like in the middle between these two words. They are like intermediately correlated, whatever that means. Actually, our answer will be a little different. It will be that these materials lie in the middle in the sense that we have some electrons which are really correlated and some which are not. And this is the orbital selectivity we'll be talking about. Okay, this is just history. And clearly, given this intermediate situation, these are all very old papers of the first generation. Uh, let's say a part of the community polarized in the weak coupling direction, another part of the community polarized in the strong coupling direction, and some started to realize that there were some anomalies which are specific to this kind of materials. But besides this polarization, there was at least something everyone agreed on, which is the, the key point in the study of these materials, and which is clearly different from the cuprates, which is the fact that the electronic structure has a multi-orbital character. We have that many bands cross the Fermi surface, and as a matter of fact, basically all the 5D orbitals are needed for a reasonable description of the fermiology. This is because the crystal field splitting is small, and you end up with this very intriguing and complicated fermiology. <coughs> Sorry. We start from parent compounds, which happen to have six electrons in these 5D orbitals. So in principle, they might well have a moth insulating ground state, even if they don't. And we have to understand why this doesn't happen. Of course, the simple answer is that the Hubbard U is small, but we'll see that the answer is actually a little more uh, interesting, I would say. The fact that we have many orbitals and this situation brings about two important things. One is that we certainly have to, in, to keep into account the Huns exchange coupling, and the other is that since we have different orbitals, we might have a different behavior between different orbitals, which is the orbital selectivity I am mentioning. So now I jump into the experimental world and I show you a diagram where we collected various experimental estimates for the effective mass enhancement in the family of the so-called 122 family, which is basically barium, uh, iron 2, arsenic 2, doped either with holes and with electrons. So here lies the, the undoped compound. Here I'm doping with electrons. Here I'm doping with holes. So here there is a, a many experimental data. This collection is actually a little few years old. It's of four, four years old. Uh, but anyway, I mean, these trends are... Uh, confirmed by every experiment. Essentially, what we have to see here is that, one, the, the black dots here are specific heat, Sommerfeld coefficient, and this does a clearly a very nice and simple thing. It just grows when we go towards hole doping, so when we decrease the number of electrons in our bands. It does steadily, and it reaches very large values of normalization. Blue one is an estimate from optics, again, of the effective mass, while when you see many symbols, this comes from experiments which are, have some kind of selectivity, for example, quantum oscillations or ARPES, which really measure different pockets. And you see that essentially the picture is that, you see, the black dots of the specific heat grow. The uh, blue lines from, uh, so, uh, from optics are sort of sleeping, while all these selective data essentially range in the window determined by these two guys. Anyway, overall, clearly, you see that the degree of correlation, if anything, increases in this direction. All this data can be summarized by just assuming that in this system, there is a coexistence of different fluids with different effective masses. If it is like that, essentially, you see that 
if there is a bunch of different effective masses, if you measure the specific heat, which is basically sum over bands, you, this will be dominated by the, large, the largest masses you have. While if you look at the optics, clearly the light guys, the one with the smallest effective mass, will dominate the conduction. So this is perfectly, everything is perfectly consistent. So you have a bunch of data, one, if you can measure them, and you have optics and specific heat that uh, set their, the boundaries. So basically, the whole story about all this data is summarized by the fact that you have an increase of the correlations of the effective masses going in this direction, and this increase is selective in some degree of freedom. Some part of the system has a much larger effective mass than some other. Then there are other experiments, and of course, let me also mention this much more recent uh, experiment that has been already mentioned in a few talks, the evidence of orbital selective pairing with ion ceridium, where essentially one sees this hierarchy of uh, quasi-particle renormalization weights, which you can picture at this level as sort of the inverse of the effective mass if we neglect the momentum dependence. So uh, this is something that will happen actually in the kind of theories I will show. Of course, in the real world, it's a little more complicated. So we have this picture, which comes from experiments, and we want to understand why this comes out in theory. So, and we, essentially, we, uh, the, as I already told you, if you want to describe this system in terms of a Hubbard-like description, you're bound to consider also the Hund's coupling. And the Hund's coupling is what we studied. It gives rise to the fact that the system wants to maximize the total spin, and then there's a second uh, choice, wants to maximize the total angular momentum. This is how the interaction looks like, actually, for T2G orbitals. And this is how it looks like if we write it down in the basis of orbitals. Okay, so essentially we, what we do now is to solve a Hubbard-like model with this kind of interactions which are dictated by the fact that I have a multi-orbital system. And I'm asking myself what happens to the mod transition. Coming to my first question, so why these guys are not mod insulators? Sorry. So now, Actually, one realizes immediately that the story is a little, is, is quite complicated. So let me start from a situation where you have the system and you have uh, total half filling. So for our case of five orbitals, this would mean five electrons in the bands. You look at Z, Z is this quasi-particle weight, which you can picture now as a, basically the inverse of the effective mass enhancement factor. So when Z will go to zero, we will have a MOT insulator. When Z equals one, you have a non-interacting system. Black line is j equals zero, and if you increase j, you obtain this data. So these data are telling you something quite simple. If you increase j, it's easier to localize the electrons. Z drops faster, so you need a smaller u to obtain mod localization. This is quite natural, and it's also what you could have expected, because mod physics is basically all about the fact that the electrons have a hard time moving because they have to, cons to fulfill the constraint given by the Hubbard U. Now I'm adding the Hund's coupling, which is a further constraint. So the motion, in principle, I can expect it to just become harder and harder, and this is what happens here. Okay, fair enough. So this would tell us that it's easier to have mod insulators if you have the Hund's coupling. So it doesn't look like what's, uh, what we are expecting looking at iron-based superconductors. But actually, the story becomes different if you look at any filling, which is integer, but not the number of electrons, not equal to the number of sites. So like you have six electrons on five orbitals, or no, no, two electrons in three orbitals, anything like that. So, a situation which, of course, can give rise to mod physics. You can localize six electrons on one atom. That's perfectly uh, uh, possible, but the picture is different. So now black, again, is uh, u equals zero, and the series of color is the same. Red, green, blah, blah, blah. So you see that if I increase j, first, for small u's, I have the same physics. It's actually easier to localize. But then the system changes its mind, and you have this change of behavior. And you see, for example, for this value of j, you see mod localization becomes very, 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 very hard. So the critical u becomes much larger. So now we have something, first point to understand the iron-based superconductors. 
we have six electrons in five bands, so we are in this situation, and so it makes perfect sense that these guys are not MOT insulators, even if the Hubbard U is sizable. But why does this happen? Of course, because, you know, my naive argument would suggest that MOT localization would always be easier. Actually, if you do the simplest thing you can do, the atomic estimate of the MOT gap, so basically just count, uh, compute the energy cost of exciting one electron from one side to the other, so energy of n plus one minus plus n minus one minus the energy for the uh, uniform situation. You can do this for, the, uh, for our problem, and you find that uh, while at half filling, the atomic gap grows, so it's, again, easier to mod localize, out of half filling, the mod gap decreases. So basically, your system has some constraints, but it just cannot open a mod gap. Essentially, the idea here is that you have, that even though you increase your interactions, you still, since the Hund's coupling is very large, you still select states which have different number of electrons, so you can still have hopping processes, even when the interactions are very large. So you end up building a phase diagram in the density U space. So here, this is the Hubbard U. This is the density. This is total half-filling, six electrons, seven, eight, blah, blah. So the black line is the MOT insulator. So this is, the black lines are telling what I just told. Here, you just need a small value of U to enter the MOT insulator. Here, you need a big one. And you're left with a wide window where the system, if you have the same value of U which would drive the system MOT insulating here, it's still a metal. And actually happens to be a quite a correlated metal, as you can see here from this color, uh, plot that tells you when the color is light, the Z is small, the system is quite correlated. So this uh, different behavior of the critical use opens up a wide window of interactions where the system remains a metal, even though it's far from the mod transition. Me uh, now, this is the same plot as before, just cut from five to nine. What I want to uh, draw your attention to is this uh, other important quantities are the charge interorbital correlations. So I'm looking at uh, the correlation between the densities of two electrons in different orbitals. And basically the point is that these guys are frozen, which is, means black, when I enter in this region. So this means that when I enter in this state, which is dominated by the Hund's coupling, and I have this resilient metal which doesn't want to die, I have that the fluctuations between different orbitals are frozen. This makes a lot of physical sense, because I, if I want to have the high spin, what, what do I do? I just have, up, for example, up spin in all the sides, which means that every attempt to have an orbital fluctuation would result in decreasing the spin, so it will be unfavored. So a, a direct consequence of this metal which wants to maximize the spin is a freezing of the interorbital charge correlations, which will be extremely important because this tells us that the behavior of different orbitals can be decoupled, which is the crucial thing we were looking at now. So now this was just, sorry, I never saw, said that this was just a five orbital Hubbard model. So no realistic band structure, pure model. Now I enter in the world of the iron-based superconductors, and I'm plotting UZ for different uh, parent compounds, iron selenium, barium 1 to 2, and this is some 11-11, five different groups. And you see that overall the plot look all like what I have discussed before. First, you, you have this region, and then you have this uh, this rapid drop, and then uh, you see this flat region where the Z doesn't drop if I still increase U. This happens in all the cases with some differences which, of course, boil down to the nature of individual materials. But uh, the thing you see is that when you enter in this region, you also see a significant spread between the Zs of the different orbitals. This is, orbital, this is plotted in an orbital selective way. So when I enter in this region where the Z are flat, since the orbital fluctuations are frozen, I have that an orbital selective behavior, and even tiny differences in the original electronic structure can turn into significant differences in the renormalized electronic structure and in a significant difference between disease. Okay, 
So here I'm showing you that in the parent compounds we find this picture plus the orbital selectivity. This is again the orbital decoupling. These are the spins. This is just uh, spin-spin correlations in different channels. They all grow because the Hund's coupling wants to do that. And these are the orbital correlations. They essentially all go to zero except those which are basically irrelevant because the electrons here do not play a role in the, in the response. Now, I can go, as I told you, what I really care about is the doping dependence. So now I've shown you that n equals six as this physics. Now let's look at the doping dependence. So now I go back to my original plot. This is essentially the original plot, just a little cleaned up from the experiments. And this is the theory. So you see, the theory is telling you that essentially qualitatively you have exactly the same behavior. So if you go in the electron doping region, everything is boring. The effective masses are small and basically orbital independent. But if you reduce the number of electrons, they can become large and orbital selective. So the experimental picture is confirmed by our theory. But now, what, when I looked at the experiment, just said that something must be selective. Now we know that this something is orbitals. And it's due to, this, to the Hund's coupling and to the Hubbard view. Now I can dig a little deep into this. So here, this is basically uh, the same plot as before. Before it was the effective masses, now I plot disease. This is useful because now you see that six is the actual materials. 5.5 is, is potassium one to two, which is the maximum whole doping you can actually do. But now in theory, I can take the liberty to go all the way down to n equals five. And I can clearly see that my Z's, which do not vanish here, do not vanish here in perfect agreement with experiments, would vanish if I would go all the way to n equals five, to the Mott insulator, which makes a lot of sense because I told you that full half filling, it's an easy situation for Mott physics. So that's what I should find. Now, so this is interesting because it's already telling me that what controls the overall degree of correlation is the distance from a Mott insulator, which doesn't exist in the iron-based superconductors, but it exists in the world of parameters. Now I can take a little, I do a little exercise. I can plot also the filling of individual orbitals. Okay, so clearly here overall the density is six, but it splits somehow between the orbitals. So I play this game, I obtain this thing, and you can see already that the orbitals which have, for example, a smaller z like the xy here, are also those which have a smaller filling. So now I can plot the z of the individual orbital as a function of its individual filling, okay? And as you see, all this thing gets sort of much simplified with respect to the original picture. You basically see that every individual orbital has a z which is proportional to its own distance from half filling. So it's like every orbital behaves like a single band doped Mott insulator. Of course, with some difference in the slope, which comes from the band structure parameters here. So uh, clearly here you see that the influence of the n equals five Mott insulator, it's very interesting because it really simplifies the whole picture into a collection of single band Hubbard models. Now I can go a little further with uh, in the comparison with experiments. And now essentially we focus on the guys which are more interesting for us which are those who have 5.5 electrons, like potassium. You can change this with rubidium or cesium, which have a different ionic radius and give rise to different bandwidths. Essentially, this is a comparison between the uh, estimate coming from, uh, from the Sommerfeld coefficient in experiments and in theory. So blue is experiment, green is theory, without changing any parameters. So we do all the calculation with the same Hubbard view and the same Hund's coupling, no fitting parameter, even though we might even think that here, since these materials are more correlated, the Hubbard view might be a little larger. But we are being really over -prudentic. We just keep the same values of view. And you see that starting from the black dots, which is density functional theory, which obviously fails, except for this uncorrelated region here, it fails badly. You see that our calculation, even using simple slave spin mean field, not the best thing you can do in the world, and without uh, adjusting parameters, just reproduces very nicely the whole behavior. 
So this is really telling us very strongly that uh, this picture is really what explains the degree of correlation of the different compounds, at least in this family, where now I think I convinced you why I want to focus so much on doping, because clearly this gives me a wide, a solid control parameter that, that really controls the degree of correlation. Now I can use, of course, this picture also for other materials which are outside this, uh, uh, this single family. Okay, so, uh, okay, essentially this concludes the part where I try to convince you that the correlations in the iron-based superconductors are orbital selective, and this part is explained by a multi-orbital Hubbard model with a Huns coupling. Basically, all these results do not really depend on using slave spins, dynamical mean field theory, or other single side mean field methods. Now, okay, I have, I have 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay, now I can play a little game. I can try to compare the cube rates with the iron based superconductors. So, what I'm, I, we took here are some data by Emmanuel a while back. When I'm plotting, sorry, the colors are quite horrible, the quasi-particle weight now resolved in momentum space in the patches that Emmanuel discussed before when we introduced the dynamical cluster approximation. So basically, no, he has uh, tiled down the um, V1 zone into patches, and this is the Z for the different patches, and here is the density for the different patches. We have few data because, of course, here many things happen, pseudo gap and so on, so we are in the safe region. But now you look at this green and yellow data, they follow quite nicely in the whole zoology of the different orbitals of the iron-based superconductors. So this is at least suggesting that basically what is realized in the iron-based superconductors as an orbital selective degree of correlation is mirrored in the cube rates, or at least in the dynamical cluster approximation treatment of the cube rates as a momentum space selectivity. Now, if I go back to my phase diagram of the iron-based superconductors, I can now do a very, very, very simple game. I can plot everything. So this is basically, these are the two superconducting domes of the one to two. Here, it's basically invisible for a reason, but it's, I mean, it's barely maybe visible from my distance. There would be the spin density wave Thing. So this is really experiments, and I just plot everything as a function of the average orbital doping. So basically, you know, this, this is with respect to five. So this is just six minus five divided by two point two. Okay, so this is one to two, the, and, and uh, this would be my putative MOT insulator. Essentially, what is my story is that if I look at my models, then at doping zero. In the iron based, I, have, I would have the MOT insulator. Then I enter in this selective MOT region, and then eventually I will end up in the Fermi liquid. And superconductivity shows up right in the crossover region between the selective mod physics and the Fermi liquid. If I go into the cube rate language, this is still the mod insulator. The selective mod region is the pseudo gap, which is basically a region where some uh, regions of the Bruan zone are gapped, they have the pseudo gap, and some others are not. And then you eventually end up in the Fermi liquid. So there is a clear correspondence between the phase diagrams, and superconductivity appears right in the same place, essentially, if you, for a moment, neglect the spin density wave, of course. In this picture, the spin density wave is something that happens here, sort of, I, I, I can be bold and call it an accident, meaning something that happens because in these materials, actually, six electrons is not a random doping, it's a commensurate doping where you have the chance to have broken symmetry phases. And that's why the spin density wave is realized. But it doesn't really impact on the degree of correlation of my system. So this is now, this is our way to compare the phase diagram of the cube rates and the iron-based superconductor. So coming back to my first slide, I don't want to compare them just setting a correspondence between the spin density wave and the MOT insulator. Now, the role, the role of the MOT insulator would be played by this putative MOT insulator. But still, I have a sequence of phases which really mirrors what happens in the cube rates. Okay, so now, so, so far, I only were to talked, besides the speculations, about the metallic state with no broken symmetry whatsoever, and I've not discussed any relation between 
the degree of correlation that I think we reproduce nicely in the experiments and the broken symmetry phases that actually happen in, in the real compounds. So here uh, I will briefly say two things of which are, uh, let's say, much less uh, uh, exhaustive than what I've discussed so far. So now I will discuss nematicity. Essentially what we do here is we'll play with arium selenium, which you heard already is like the place where we want to study nematic effects and their relations with superconductivity, and we add a nematic perturbation. In this paper, we consider th th three different options, uh, which I don't discuss in details, but this is orbital fair ordering, so a change of populations. These are other options that have been discussed in the literature, a sign change in bond order and the D-wave bond order uh, this way. My bottom line is that what, so here, these are disease. These are the, my favorite plot of disease that drop uh, at some point. When this disease drops, we don't find any spontaneous symmetry breaking in this direction. So what we do is we add a field and we really do the basic thing. We compute the response to the field and we don't find a divergence. So the system doesn't want to spontaneously break the symmetry. This is the uh, susceptibility and you see they don't do anything uh, particularly exciting. But what we observed is that if we add this small perturbation, this triggers a differentiation of disease, which goes perfectly in the picture I've shown you before. If you add some perturbation, you will slightly change the populations of the orbitals. And these will change their degree of correlation according to our scheme before. So if I add this perturbation, I trigger a differentiation of disease, and if I compute something which I can sort of call a nematic susceptibility, which is like computing a sort of derivative of disease with respect to the field, I find an enhancement exactly when I enter the crossover region. So the bottom line, but to be honest, the effect numerically is small, and it doesn't allow us to, for example, to be compared with the numbers that have been extracted by uh, the analysis of Shamus Davis experiments that has been discussed before. Still, so essentially, so my, my list of results is that there is no spontaneous symmetry breaking. There is this uh, effect on the, on the on disease, but uh, the effect is small. Actually, more recently, uh, Chimiaosi and co-workers have found that if you take a mixed perturbation, let's say maybe Chimiaosi, which has a combination of D plus S bond nematic ordering, you can even get some much more uh, larger uh, differentiation between the orbitals, which goes in the direction of the experiments. I mean, I cannot add much on this because I didn't actually do the calculation. Now I spend my last uh, second to give you uh, something, some work in progress about superconductivity, where I take a similar point of view as I did before. I add a built-in perturbation. So now I don't want to hope that pairing comes out from my Huber model. I just add a pairing interaction, which I, which I will treat very simply in uh, mean field, in a BCS way. Now, the game I play, so these are plots of the gap as a function of the Hubbard U, where I'm playing two different games. One is to use just, a, and so I do BCS using dressed Green's function, where the dressing comes from dynamical mean field theory. So I introduce all this Hund's physics. And essentially, if you look, these are data for different values of J, you see, basically, the, for example, let's look here. This pink data here are those where I just use a Fermi liquid uh, approximation to my DMFT self-energy. So I just extract a Z and uh, uh, the real part of the self-energy at zero frequency. And you see, what I obtain is that if I start from a given superconducting gap and I crank up U, this is very rapidly killed. But if I really include the real self-energy that comes out from the MFT, which, uh, I remind you, is momentum independent, but it's orbital dependent, of course, which is crucial here, you see that my gaps survive much, much longer. And this effect is much more evident the more I increase the Hund's coupling. So essentially, what I'm showing here is that uh, our strongly correlated Hund's metal, which it has all these properties that I tried to discuss you. It's much more, uh, it, let's say, it's much more compatible with the superconducting channels we have than a more standard correlated system, which is just parameterized by a Z. Uh, 
So if you want to go in the other direction, the opposite direction, if you look at an experiment, you need a much smaller z to understand what is observing the experiments uh, than if you use just a Fermi liquid approximation. This is exactly what we are doing. This is exactly what we are doing. So basically, this is telling us, so this is really somehow, somehow working problem, but it's really telling us that the coherent part of the Green's function is playing some role. And actually, the part which really matters is the one on the scale of the Hund's coupling. So of course, we are not taking advantage of what happens at the scale of the Hubbard U, which would be strange, or it just never happens. But we are exploiting a peculiarity of the system here. So uh, the G that you are taking there is a finite, uh, it's a finite energy scale. So this result also depends how somehow, or do you have a cutoff if you want for pairing or not? Well, do so you uh, pair say it up to any energy level or you have a cutoff for pairing? Uh, so the question would be, imagine that you have a cutoff for the pairing. So does the result depend on how large is this cutoff with respect to U or J? Yes, in the sense that, of course, if it's uh, uh, negligible with respect to the scale of the Hund's coupling, you don't see anything. <laughs> no? Yeah, I'm, fine. I'm basically done. So uh, that's a list of conclusions, which is what I said. I mean, just to be very rapid, the Hund's coupling favors orbital decoupling and orbital selectivity. And I mean, I would try to convince you this is a simple mechanism, it's not like black magic. And uh, that orbital selective correlation are the organizing principle of the degree of correlation of the normal state of the iron-based superconductors, and they are controlled by these hidden mod states, which allows me to establish a link with the cube rates. Then coming to broken symmetry phases, we don't find so far that they are uh, the source of these low energy instabilities, but they have a non-trivial interplay. Uh, so I mean, at the very least, when we study these weak coupling instabilities in this Hund's metal, we have to carefully uh, take into account the peculiarities of the Hund's metal beyond the simple picture of an effective Fermi liquid with normalized this. Thank you for your attention.